All right, we're on. Okay, so the um, uh, last last week we, in following along in our curriculum sheet, we did uh, Roman numeral two, letter B, and we did number five. We did a whole deep dive into cooking and preparing warm food uh, on Shabbat and how that's done. And the piece that I, I just want to like take some time today and just go through. Um, the rest of the 39 milachot. So these are the other 39 biblical categories of labor. And I just want to sort of at least name them all. I don't think we're going to do like an exhaustive description of each of them, just so we should, you should know what they are. Uh, I'm going to share, here's another link of, of a pretty cool document I found. Uh, this is from the OU website from a bunch of years ago, but they, they, these, these haven't changed. Okay, there you go. Um, so if you, if I'll just, I'll see you joining. Yeah, hi, welcome, welcome Miriam. Um, I'll share it again, I just shared in the chat a, li a link to a, to something from the OU website, which I'm gonna, I'll share my screen, we can look at it, just see it together, I guess that we're, um, there we go. Okay, so, so they have here all of the 39 categories of labor, okay? You'll see uh, number, um, where is it? Oh, interesting. The order is, is the, oh, it's the, it's the opposite uh, order of, it's weird. Okay, anyway. I don't know how they pick that order. That's not the order that they, any event, okay. So these are they. We thought we, we did, we did, um, we, we did uh, cooking last time, but what a strange order. They're not, what, what, how do they, how on earth did they? Uh... All right. Anyway, I mean, I don't know how they pick this order. So I'm sorry, but it whatever. It doesn't really matter per se. So carrying. Okay, it's prohibited. So just just go through them really quickly. And I encourage you know you should find out find resources. There are books on that I can recommend that that go through in great detail. But you should know just the in the the broad strokes what these prohibited category okay, carrying means. Um, carrying from a private domain to a public domain, or from a public domain to a private domain or carrying within a public domain more than four cubits. That's about six feet in a public domain. So uh, that means you don't carry keys, you don't push a stroller, you don't carry a book, you don't carry uh, an umbrella uh, or a plastic bag with your with your change of clothing. Uh, none of that can be carried on Shabbat with the exception of a neighborhood that's enclosed in an Erev. An Erev is a symbolic um, halachic boundary that cordons off a neighborhood which means that for purposes of Shabbat, an entire neighborhood can be considered like a private domain in which it's permissible to carry, okay? Uh, but with, in the absence of an Erev, if it's, or if our neighborhood has one, but sometimes it gets, parts get knocked over by, uh, you know, whatever, a snowplow or a storm or construction, then, then carrying is forbidden outside of one's home, okay? There are workarounds. You can put your keys on a belt in such a way that the keys are functional and keeping your belt on. Um, and, um, so that that works. That's that's a um, that's a workaround. There are ways to turn the keys into your um, into your shoelaces. You can't just tie the keys to your shoes, but you can wrap your shoelaces through the keys so that the key functions in place of one of that first bow knot that you would tie, and then in that way the the key is functional. Okay, it's like keeping your shoes on, not not something that you're carrying. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna go fast again. If you have questions, pause. Okay, or just just unmute yourself and yell. It's not or use this chat. It's a small. We're a small crowd tonight, so okay, no need to stand on ceremony. Okay, uh, two on their list: burning. Okay, burning and extinguishing, lighting a fire, extinguishing a fire, transferring a fire. That's we saw that we talked about last week. That's one of the uh, animating fears that that animate a lot of the restrictions on heating food on Shabbat, right? And around cooking, not only can we not cook, we don't even want to do something that's going to tempt us to stoke the fire because we don't. We don't light. The Torah says, "Lo tivar eish b'chomus v'dicham b'yom Shabbat." The Torah says, "You can't have any." fires being in our homes on Shabbat, and that was subject to various interpretations in ancient times. Does that mean you can't have fire lit at all? Should we sit around in the dark on Shabbat? And there were some Jews who said, yes, we should sit around in the dark on Shabbat. And our ancestors said, no, we should actually light fire before Shabbat. We should have uh, light in our home uh, and have an illuminated, pleasant environment on Shabbat, but the lighting has to take place before Shabbat begins. Okay, we don't burn, we don't extinguish. Finishing. Finishing means anything that is... Um, um, like, like the final hammer blow. You're making something, the, the task that like completes it into a complete 
usable, workable um, tool. So maybe putting a string on a guitar or um, setting up a sound system, plugging in the microphone and adjusting it, et cetera, right? You're, it's, it's not workable until the final step. The final step might be small, but that's what turns it into something that now is workable. There's someone suggested that um, turning on any electronic device, like finishing it, you have a radio, it's sort of silent. I flip the switch. Now the circuit is complete and now it's making noise. So now it's it's like completing. Uh, so others said, no, that's not, that's not completing it. That's just operating a radio, okay? It's like, a, you wouldn't say closing a door is building a wall. You'd say you're opening, closing a door. Okay, I'm opening, closing a folding chair. I'm not building a chair, right? So operating something that has an open state and a closed state is different from completing something and building something. But nonetheless, this malacha does exist. This is a category of labor that remains on the books. And again, that would be when you do finally complete something that was not completed until then. Um, writing, can't write on Shabbat, okay? Um, in cases of like some medical emergency, like you're admitted to a hospital and you have to sign sign something before they treat you. So if it's a matter of life and death, just sign doesn't really matter. If you have a, if you have a little bit of, uh, if the emergency is, is, is slightly mitigated and you have, uh, you can keep this in mind, then you can just do like an X, okay? With your, with your non-dominant hand, which is not a biblical violation. A biblical violation is two letters with your dominant hand. If you use your non-dominant hand, if you just write one letter like an X, uh, then, uh, then that would be, um, only rabbinic prohibition, not the full-fledged biblical prohibition of writing on Shabbat. Um, erasing, erasing is erasing, okay. Uh, erasing in order to write something new is the actual biblical prohibition. Erasing something just uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, like, uh, well, this comes up, people are, some people are very um, concerned about opening up food packages, not like if you, you open up your yogurt thing or you open a little thing of pretzels. So, if you're not careful, as you open it, you could tear letters. And tearing letters, like you had a word, now you don't have a word anymore because you opened the package in such a way that you tore a letter. Or you cut a cake, the cake says, uh, happy birthday, and you cut it, and now it no longer says, uh, you know, it doesn't say anything because you, you ate the letters, you cut the letters. So there are people who are strict about that and uh, because it's a form of erasing, even though it's not the actual biblical level of erasing because you're not erasing in order to write something new. So to avoid that, just be more careful when you open, open packaging that you don't uh, tear letters. Uh, here in Chicago, the jewel up in, um, you know, the big kosher jewel up, up north, you can get cakes made special, like you get like a sheet cake with like a message on it. You can have the, put the writing on a piece of plastic and the plastic rests on top of the cake. So you can show the cake to your friend and says, happy birthday, or we love you so much or whatever. And then you, you can lift the plastic off and uh, then you cut the cake, you know, have to, no risk of cutting letters. So this is, uh, yeah, I, don't think, yeah, I don't think this is like strictly necessary because you're not cutting it to write something in its place. You're not actually intending to erase. You're just intending to eat some cake. But uh, there are those who are strict, and you know why not be strict if you can be. Questions, comments? Okay, great. We're zooming through. All right. Um, cooking. Cooking. We talked about last week. I'm not going to say about that. Washing. Washing really means laundering. Okay, that means like cleaning uh, stains, coloring out of fabric. So this could come up on Shabbat. Yeah, this 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 could come up. You uh, you spill a little bit of wine on your shirt. So your instinct is, let me pour some seltzer on it. Let me like get the stain off. You can't do that on Shabbat, okay? Like laundering is one of the forbidden categories of labor. You, something falls on your shirt, your shirt's gonna have stains, okay? That's that's a well-loved shirt, it has stains on it, okay? That, that's just how it goes. Um, you, you, can't, you can't launder. Uh, you are allowed to like dry something. You take a napkin and, you know, you know, sop up the, the liquid, but you can't, the, they can't remove something from, uh, from, you know, some stain from clothing. If you get crumbs on your clothes, you can brush the crumbs off, crumbs off, you know, that's not washing, that's just brushing up crumbs. Um, uh, sewing, okay, is, is sewing, but also included in sewing would be connecting any two things together in a permanent way. So putting stickers is, pr may be a violation if it's permanent. If it's a temporary sticker, it's probably okay. If it's going to be permanent, it's probably not going to be okay. So I don't know if that relevant, I don't know, like if you, this comes up sometimes if you're studying or you're reading and you want to put little like post-it notes in the pages to, you know, like your little arrow post-it notes, you know, if you're studying on Shabbat, this is, I don't know, this is a big thing in college, like you would put the little arrow post-its, it's like, because you can't underline, right? So you put your little arrow post-its on the pages or the paragraphs you want to remember if you're reading something on Shabbat for, you know, let's say for a school project or for something, something serious, we need to you know, uh, remember what you saw and what you want to emphasize. So if the arrows are not permanent, it's probably okay. Like post-its are meant to go in, you know, you, you put them down, you take them off, you put them down, you take them off. That's how they're designed. They're not that sticky, but if it was a permanent sticker, like, um, 
like you're putting a label on something. So that might be tofer. It's like it's like sewing because you're attaching two things that were not attached. Now you're making them attached. Tearing is the opposite. Something which was whole, you're now tearing into pieces, but it has to be constructive. If you're tearing just destructively, that doesn't count because all of the malachot are constructive, deliberate, considered forms of labor. If you're doing destructively, it's not uh, considered uh, any of these malachot. So tearing in anger or just to be destructive, that wouldn't count. But if you're tearing something constructively, that might be probably what's an example of tearing constructively that we have to avoid on Shabbat? Can you think of the example? Tear something, you want something to be just the right size, so you're going to tear it. Like if you're making lettuce for salad? Well, yeah. Who said, who said, who said that? Miriam. Hi, Miriam. I, I don't think so, because I think that's like, that would be um, part of like cutting something for food. So that's like its own separate category. You're just like getting your meal ready, chopping lettuce. That, that, that falls under the definition of, uh, of grinding or something like that, which, which has its own permutations. If you're cutting something not all that small, just to like eat it, that, that would be okay. Um, okay. Tearing, although if it would be like if you're making like, I don't know, like, like um, stuffed cabbage or something and it has to be, I want my, you know, my cabbage leaves or my gra stuffed grape leaves and the grape leaves have to be at least three inches but not more than six inches, I'm going to tear it on the edge to make sure that might be a problem. <laughs> um, example, I was thinking, of, another example, common example of this would be tearing toilet paper, okay, where you don't really care, you don't necessarily care, like I want to, you know, how many squares, whatever, like you don't, you don't, people aren't necessarily that... Um, precise and how and how long it is so it's probably okay but because you don't really care all that much exactly how long it is but uh, the common practice among observant orthodox Jews is not to tear toilet paper and instead to prepare either to cut toilet paper before Shabbat just to take a roll of toilet just cut it into a stack of cut toilet paper or to use like a box of tissues something like that okay and you can actually actually sell pre-cut toilet paper for the Jewish market okay you can buy such a thing uh, so that would be an example of tearing. Knotting, tying a fancy knot. This is rest, less relevant. It's like we don't really, most of us don't tie like fancy knots anymore, but um, maybe like uh, certain types of necktie knots. Not the standard tie that I know how to do, but some of the more elaborate necktie knots might be a problem on Shabbat. And untying would be the same type of same malacha. Shaping means shaping something solid. Um, this would be a problem if you use bar soap. A bar soap is a solid. When you use bar soap, you're, you're shifting, you're wearing it away and you're changing its shape. So we don't use bar soap on, bar soap on Shabbat, only uh, liquid soap. Um, plowing is preparing soil for, you know, things going into the soil. So you don't, you also can't like water the garden or anything that's gonna get the soil ready for planting. Planting, actually putting seeds into the soil. So I don't know how that would be, you know, like we don't do that much live in the city, but if you have a picnic on Shabbat, don't spit out your watermelon seeds into the ground, okay? <laughs> that would be a problem. Uh, if you have a picnic, don't wash your hands over the grass where the water will flow and water the grass or, or, and promote growth. Uh, reaping is cutting anything that's growing, so picking an apple or uh, breaking a leaf off a tree or anything of that kind. Rabbinically, we don't lean on trees or touch trees on Shabbat. Um, um, Reaping, sort of reaping versus harvesting. I think harvesting is like piling the stuff up in a pile. Threshing, we talked about that last time, right? That's also milking a cow or uh, also is entailed in that, but it's also removing the wheat from the chaff. Winnowing is using the wind to sort things. Selecting is actually sorting. Sorting can come up. You can't take something that you don't want out of something that you want, okay? So if you, even if other people might want it, it could be an issue. So if you, um, this comes up if, uh, let's say, if you have a fly in your soup, okay? So rather than just pick the fly out, which might be sorting, take a spoon and kind of scoop the fly with some of the soup out of the bowl and then discard it. Because then you're not, what are you removing from the bowl? Fly and soup, not just the fly, okay? So you're not actually sorting the fly alone from out of the soup, okay? If you don't like raisins, don't pick the raisins out of your whatever, okay? Like um, that also might be an issue if you, picking the bones out of fish might be an issue. Again, you're sorting, you're taking the thing you don't want out of what you want. Uh, if you want it, picking the watermelon seeds again, remember, I don't think people, watermelons don't have seeds anymore. When I was a child, watermelons still had seeds, okay? And uh, you, can't, you can't pick the seeds out of the watermelon. Rather, what you do, you put bite into it and then spit out the seeds, okay? You're not sorting what you don't want from what you want. Um, you are allowed to take what you want from what you don't want, okay? So if you love raisins, you can take the raisins out of somebody else's whatever. I have a question, everybody. Yeah. Um, I was looking this up like last week. Um, for example, like a like a Brita filter, does that is that does that apply in terms of like separating? Would you 
put water in like a, in a filter? Great question. Great question. It does not because the water is entirely um, like at, like drinkable and potable before you filter. So the filter is like, you wanna, I don't know, you, want, you like it better when it's filtered or you feel it's a little healthier, you feel it tastes a little better, that's fine. But basically it's potable before you filter it. And so you're not actually moving anything that's like, that's like recognizable or, you know, um, is, yeah. Is this rule like, a, like is, the, is the idea that it, it goes like at the individual level, like if I wouldn't drink other, unless it was filtered, does it matter, or is it just like the general it's populace? Very good. It's a very sophisticated question. This this emerged. This came up in New York, um, what, 10, 15 years ago. There was the whole um, discovery that uh, the tap water in New York City has little uh, crustaceans called copepods that live in the water. Um, okay. uh, New, New York, it's an interesting story. New York City they has an exemption from the federal clean safe clean water you know standards because um, the water is so good. It comes from the mountains and these uh, mountain streams in the Catskills and the Adirondacks, and it, it's brought to the city in these giant aquifers. Uh, and because it's such high quality water and the, they, the New York City owns like thousands and thousands of acres of forests and mountains up state, uh, which it keeps from development. And so the water is very clean, et cetera, et cetera. And New York City doesn't have to filter its water in the same way that other municipalities do have to filter their water. And so New York City water has these copepods, these tiny little crustaceans. They get killed by the chlorination process but they're in the water. And uh, the reason why you can't see them is because they're dead. So they're kind of like, and they're a little bit transparent. Uh, but if you pour the water through like a black piece of construction paper, you can see them. They're, they're not, they're not, they're visible to the naked eye. They're not, you don't need a microscope to see them. They're big enough to see. Oh, wow. Uh, the only reason you can't see them again, because it's chlorinated. If you were to take non-chlorinated tap water, such as, if you could find such a thing, you would see them swimming around. And if you take the tap water and you filter it through a black construction paper, you can see them. So when this was discovered, there are some who said, it doesn't matter, you can still drink the water for X, Y, Z reasons. And there's some who said, you can't drink the water and you have to filter it. Uh, and so then the question was, well, if I have to filter it, do I have to, um, can I do it on Shabbat? And the answer was, yes, you can filter on Shabbat because even though Jews who are careful about this prohibition against eating crustaceans are not gonna drink the water without filtering it, since our non-Jewish neighbors can drink the water and fundamentally it's drinkable and potable without filtration, then what we're doing is, is really just to help us observe the mitzvah, but it's not to remove something that makes the water from non-potable to potable. And so it's okay to do it on Shabbat. Got it. So, Makes sense. Yeah, okay. A lot has been written about this. This was like a big, this was like the big thing, you know, it was, it was back in 2004, I think, 2003, 2004, 2004, when, when this was, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're still there, right? I like, they haven't gone away, but it was like a big, big issue in uh, like biggest news in like the Jewish world in 2004 it was uh, the discovery of copepods in New York City water. Um, okay. Um, Select, selecting, sifting, all kinds of basic grind. Grinding is uh, grinding grain, but also maybe like there's some restrictions on how fine can you chop a vegetable. So some say it shouldn't be super fine. Making a salad, like an Israeli style salad, you chop a vegetable very fine. So it's probably fine, but at some point it might not be fine. So there's some, you know, making egg salad and, you know, there's some, some, some who are strict about those types of um, uh, cooking pr processes that involve very fine chopping of ingredients. The, the, there are others who are lenient. Um, if, these, if you cook such things, you should look into this in greater detail. Kneading, can't make dough, knead dough. Uh, combing, this is like, and spinning and dyeing. This is like, these are like wool preparation kinds of uh, malachot. Um, dyeing though is like any, you know, adding color to something that, that could be relevant. You can't intentionally add color to something. So this also means, also is true, for, you can't add food coloring to something on Shabbat. You shouldn't, um, there's some who are strict not to mix grape juice in their water, but only to mix water in their grape juice. Okay, yeah, they're mixing like, my kids sometimes like to mix seltzer with grape juice to make like a grape soda. So if you have seltzer and you put grape juice in, maybe the grape juice is coloring the water and that might be a problem of this malacha of dyeing, of, of, of changing something's color, giving color, something that didn't have it. Whereas if you just add the seltzer to the grape juice, then that wouldn't be relevant. Chain stitching, warping, weaving. These are all like weaving kinds of malachot, unraveling, etc. These are not so relevant. Uh, well, big question is whether, whether whether knitting, you know, where it falls in. It's clearly you can't knit on Shabbat, but no one really knows why because knitting was invented. You know, knitting was invented. We know. 
knitting did not fit and exist in the time of the Talmud. Knitting was invented in the Middle Ages. Uh, it's not exactly like tying because you have that loose thread and you can pull and the whole thing would come undone if you pull. Um, and it's not really sewing or weaving, right? Because you're just sort of tying this, tying like this one thing together to, onto itself. Um, so it's sort of strange. It's, it's, cool. it's kind of cool, but it's not, not weaving and it's not tying a knot. It's its own thing. Invented in the Middle Ages. Um, okay. Um, building. Building means... Uh, uh, you know, building something up, I, um, could be building a hole, building a, mount, a mound, um, um, building a wall, this would be relevant, yeah, I'm trying to think this would come up, uh, doesn't come up too often, erecting, oh, erecting a tent, we don't write tents on Shabbat, we don't uh, open umbrellas on Shabbat, oh, that's all, those are all kind of similar types of things, and demolishing is the opposite, Malacha. Trapping an animal, you can't trap an animal on Shabbat, um, now here, here you get to the, that that um, distinction of the biblical and the rabbinic. The biblical prohibition is to trap an animal because you want that animal. Okay, I'm going to trap a fish because I want to eat a fish. I'm going to trap a deer so I can kill it and eat it. I'm going okay. But if I trap an animal, not because I want the animal itself, but because I don't want the animal, I don't want the animal to scare me or bite me. Right? Like I'm going to trap a bee. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't sting me, that doesn't count as this biblical, doesn't reach the biblical threshold of this malacha because I'm not trapping it for the thing itself because I want the bee to like mount on my wall. I'm trapping the bee so it doesn't sting me or right and what leaves me alone. Uh, so that's only a rabbinic prohibition. And this rabbinic prohibition is overruled if it's something dangerous or frightening. So you can um, trap an animal on Shabbat if it's dangerous or frightening if you don't want the animal itself. The goal is not to eat it or stuff it or use its skin for something to make a carpet, right? No, the point is I just don't want this bee to eat me or bite me or scare it, right? Scare me, then I can I can trap it as well. Um, shearing can't, you know, take hair, cut hair off a sheep or any other animal. Slaughtering can't kill an animal or cause a wound in any animal uh, or a person. Can't do anything which can lead to bleeding of a person either. Moving skinning, moving the skin of an animal, tanning, processing the skin of an animal, smoothing. Uh, the skin of an animal and marking. Marking would be also like a, if you've ever seen a tourist scroll up close, you'll notice that it has a kind of these like, a, what do you call it, um, scoring lines uh, etched into the parchment to help the, the scribe write in a straight way. And um, so making those markings is like a preparatory to writing. So that's also not allowed. Okay, so you can see that you have this link and, and they have examples for, it looks like for all of these and you can explore on your own. And there are other of their books, they're great books that, uh, you know, also go through these 39 melachot and your practical ex examples and sort of contemporary examples of all of these melachot. And it's, I commend, you know, re recommend them to you uh, and the screen share. And you have that link now. You can follow along on your own. Okay. I just gave you a ton of information in a very short amount of time. Any questions or comments on what I said? Yeah, Nissan. Sorry. I have several questions. So I feel like on Shabbat, I always have like great ideas, but I can never write them down. Uh, and then I forget them to time. So can one write on Shabbat via erasing? Meaning to say, if I had like a board that was completely black and I was erasing parts to add letters into the board, or like if there was like so much dust on something that like I used my finger uh, and yeah, I wrote. No, yeah, you can't, yeah, that would also be like any type of writing, any type of, that's that's a form of writing. So you can't write in a mirror. You steam in a, a steamy, foggy mirror, you can't write. That's also writing. It's, it's not a biblical okay. writing. It's not permanent. So it's not a biblical violation, but it still can't write. What you could do is some sort of like um, you could you could have a um, you could like take paper clips and put them next to letters or something like that right that's that's temporary right it's not permanent you're not changing anything or writing anything we have like letters and you can put paper clips next to letters and hopefully that reminds you of what you're going to remember so we used to do this at the shul we used to have you know, when I said used to have, I mean, like two years ago, we had a big an auction on Simchat Torah. And we would auction off uh, all sorts of things and for all sorts of amounts of money. So what we did was we came up with a system where, uh, and it was always, each year, it was like always an issue each year because like, there was like several items that were put up for auction and the auctioneer had to remember who made the winning bid, how much they bid for, and um, right, right, for each item, okay? And it was very, very hard for them to remember. So we came up with a system based, I, I try to remember what we came up with. I think we had like one, we had a directory of, of everyone in the shul. 
And then we had a little post-it arrow with the name of all the items that were bid upon. So next to the winner, we would put a little arrow saying, you know, Nisim bid on the Chassan Torah Aliyah, you know, and he won it. So we put your name, this is a little arrow, Chassan Torah, we put it next to your name in the directory. And then we'd have a separate piece of paper which had all the items that were up for auction. And then we would, how would we, uh, I think we had like a list of numbers or something. We put the arrow next to the number for the amount of the item. It was like a graph or something. We put the arrow next to the number that, uh, that the winning bid was. And that way after Yantif was over, the office would go and, you know, call his Nissan, thanks for, you know, dollars <laughs> for, you know, that thank you so much for generous donation. And we could follow right. up. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. So there are other ways, you know, I, I think there are rabbis also, you know, and uh, whatever I used to think. We used to have like, again, like hundreds of people used to come to Shul and Shabbat and have conversations and went to follow up. So I know there are rabbis who would have like uh, also like a similar, like, a, like all the letters of the alphabet and like some chart and you would put your paperclip next to the the, the letter of the alphabet to see, to hopefully remind you of like the name of the person you spoke to and like you had to follow up and like, oh yeah, you know, Noel told me that she has a whatever a job interview on Tuesday and I should like send her a text to wish her luck, right? So. That's, that's what you think of. Gotcha. Um, what if you had like uh, magnetic letters, like fridge magnets, like children sometimes play with? Yeah, fridge magnets, I think, I, think, I think it's fine because it's not permanent. Uh, it's not, yeah. But here's an issue, here's a, here's a quote. What about, you know, there are some who say there's a difference between the, um, like what, Scrabble, okay, writing with Scrabble letters. Okay, you're playing Scrabble on Shabbat. So, um, so you're putting your letters on the board, that's not permanent. Um, you and, and you're meant to take them out and rearrange them, and that's how you play the game. You put the letters down, and then the game's over. You like take them up and move them away. There's some who said that we should be strict with or distinguish between regular Scrabble and deluxe Scrabble, because deluxe Scrabble the squares are like set in deeper settings, so it's a little bit more permanent. You put them there, they really could like settle there and stay there for a while. And so there's some who are strict not to use deluxe Scrabble on Shabbat. Um, then for keeping score, since you can't, you know, like use a pen and paper to like, you know, add up your numbers, you just, um, you take a book with a lot of pages and you stick a bookmark in the page number that corresponds to the points you have. And as you accumulate points, you just move your bookmark into the, through the book to page 205, 223, 256, whatever, as you accumulate points. So that's like Shabbos Scrabble. Uh, when it comes to puzzles, if you make a puzzle, and now you have an image that is complete, that would be a form of writing. If the intention is to keep the puzzle, to like whatever, laminate it, pick, you know, and frame it, whatever. If the intention is I'm just playing a game and I put the pieces together and I'll take them apart again, then that's probably fine. Uh, same with you for Legos, okay? If you're, if, if the fun is to make the Lego thing and then to take it apart and to make it and to take it apart and I'm gonna play with it, and that, that would probably be okay on Shabbat. But if I'm gonna like follow every instruction to the letter, step by step by step, and when I'm done, I'm gonna like mount my Lego, whatever, on my shelf and never touch it again, uh, then that would be a problem of, of, of Shabbat. Not of, not of writing, but of building. Okay? I'm constructing something, I'm making something on Shabbat. Um, okay, any questions? All right. Um, okay, let's we'll look, go back to our syllabus thing. So let me have a screen. Uh, This is, uh, I, I can't see my, hold on. Sorry. There it is, okay. Um, okay, let's well, letter three. So, so for all of these melachot, I sort of alluded to this already, all of these melachot, there are like the biblical threshold of like, you violate this from the Torah, which in ancient times meant you could get a, capital punishment and, you know, whatever serious punishment, serious consequences for violating this Torah level prohibition of Shabbat. But the rabbinic extensions of these um, milachot, which are not necessarily, I think we talked about this last week, but it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily, some of them are additional rabbinic prohibitions, like you can't ride a horse, lest you break off a branch to hit the horse. That's like a new piece of legislation. But the others are like, no, it doesn't meet the threshold of the biblical prohibition. It's still rabbinically prohibited. So I'm not, I, not um, I'm running with my left hand. That's a rabbinic prohibition. I'm, I'm trapping an animal, not because I want the animal, because I don't want the animal to bite me. That's a rabbinic prohibition, okay? So all of these milachot have a point at which it doesn't quite uh, get up to 
the biblical prohibition and threshold, but it still would be prohibited rabbinically. And that is, um, and, and those rabbinic prohibitions are sometimes overridden by other concerns, like it's, um, in another example, I can't, can't milk a cow on Shabbat. We, that's threshing, okay? How is milking threshing? Because it's removing something uh, from, something that you want from the context in which it grew and developed. So taking the milk out of the cow's udder is milking. That's a biblical prohibition. That's a derivative of threshing. What if I'm milking not because I want the milk, but because I want to, um, I want my cow to stay healthy and produce more milk. Okay, so that would be a rabbinic prohibition because I don't actually want the milk. I'm just doing this action. It's the same action that I'm doing, not because I want the milk, but because I don't want the, because uh, I want something else. I want the animal, the cow to produce more milk. Uh, or I, or let's say, or the, actually, I mean, um, or what actually happens is um, if you don't milk the cow, it'll be in great distress and pain. You have to milk the cow every day. So I milk the cow on Shabbat, not because I want the milk, but because I want to alleviate pain for the animal. And that's fine. Because um, then a secondary question is, well, can I keep the milk or not? The reason why I'm milking the cow is not because I want the milk, it's because I want to alleviate suffering of the cow. Once I do that, do I have to discard the milk to show that I really don't want it? Or uh, can I then use it? And this actually, this is an issue in Israel today where there are Jewish owned dairies and the, uh, the extra kosher dairies will discard the milk that they milk on Shabbat. Whereas the regular kosher dairies will use that milk um, because they um, say, well, I'm milking it to alleviate the suffering of the animal. And then once it's permissible for you to do that, I might as well use the milk as well. And it's true that it's all automated now anyway. My cousin lives in a moshav where they milk cows and they, the cows sort of do it on their own. Like they, there's no need for, there's very little need for a person. The cows like no to walk to this milking machine when they feel the need to, they feel their udders are full and the machine kind of does everything and there's no person extracting milk. So it's also makes it easier. Um, Okay. Now, number four. Let's see if we can finish up this, finish up letter, uh, letter B. Um, in the times of the Torah, in the times of the Bible, most Jews, it seems, lived in farms, uh, and, and, and many of the mitzvah of the Torah surround agriculture, these 39 categories of labor are, most of them, or much, many of them are agricultural. Once you reach the time of the Talmud, Jews are already living mostly in towns and cities. And most Jews are no longer rural or farmers. And the rabbis of the Talmudic era realized that Shabbat was too similar to the weekday, since um, most of these Shabbat um, prohibitions were things that we didn't do on weekdays either, right? When was the last time you threshed? When was the last time you plowed? Okay, probably it's been weeks, okay? If you've ever done it in your life, okay? And so they realize, oh, Shabbat and the weekday, like they're too similar because like the things that I don't do on Shabbat are things I don't do anyway. And so they said, let's make additional restrictions. These were acts of rabbinic legislation, Muktza, what it's called. Let's have rabbinic prohibitions against moving things that have no Shabbat use. So that I can't, you know, move my tools, and you know, let's also make restrictions furthermore on buying and selling things. And so commerce has to come to a stop on Shabbat, and moving around things that have no Shabbat use. So that in this way, Shabbat is really a different day. I'm not manipulating my surroundings in the same way. I'm not in my shop selling things or, move, or, or moving my merchandise. Um, everything that I need is set up before Shabbat. My world is sort of set up and ready and waiting for me. And then on Shabbat, I exist within the world as, it, as, as it's been created by God and adjusted and further refined by myself during the six days of the week. And then on Shabbat, I'm just living within the world. But many, but that's really rabbinic, uh, like kind of extension that kind of creates that. Because the biblical melachot, uh, many of us don't do them anyway. Uh, and I would say that's even the more so in modern times when electricity was invented and electronic devices began to spread. Uh, scholars, um, stop screen, sorry. Um, scholars struggled to think through what exactly is the prohibition that's entailed in using electricity. And some said electricity is a form of building. When I complete a circuit, it's like I'm building something. I'm completing a tool. And I said, that makes no sense. That's like opening and, fold and closing a folding chair. I'm not 
building a chair. I'm not building a radio by turning it on. I'm just operating a chair. And some said other things, okay? Um, what I think is most convincing and, the, the, and what I was taught is most likely correct is that electricity per se doesn't entail any one of the 39 categories of labor per se, unless the electronic device is itself doing something that's one of the categories of labor. If I have an electronic lawnmower, which is cutting my grass, that is reaping. That's like, that's any other way of detaching something that's growing. If I have an electric oven that's cooking, so that's cooking, but the electricity per se, just using an electronic device, like a phone or a computer, which, or a doorbell, it's not itself doing anything that is um, prohibited, uh, doesn't seem to violate any of the 39 categories of labor. Nonetheless, there is a universal practice among Sabbath observant Jews from the invention of electricity until today, not to use electronic devices on Shabbat. And I think that defines Shabbat in a really, really intense, meaningful, powerful, positive way, uh, sort of akin to these muktza restrictions that the rabbis added in the Talmudic period. When the rabbis realized that Jews were no longer living on farms or were now living in cities, they said, well, we have to make Shabbat a little more distinctive. Let's have a rabbinic uh, decree against commerce and let's have these muktza laws so we don't manipulate and move our items that we don't need for Shabbat on Shabbat itself. I think for us, like 25 hours a week without email and without using my phone and without television or radio, I think is so, so important. So like, it defines Shabbat as a special day, as a different day in a way that many of these malachot are kind of meaningless, right? Because they don't, I don't do them anyway. I don't weave, I don't farm, right? So these are just not uh, um, necessarily so relevant. So I think that dynamic is, remains that there are things that maybe it's not one of the 39 categories of labor, but I still like, I embrace it as a Shabbat restriction because it is what makes Shabbat a different day and a special day. And that's like, that's what we need. That's what we need. Okay, we need help. We need to carve away, to clear away uh, some time to do all the positive, fun, enjoyable, enriching things that make Shabbat so wonderful for us. Um, and so I'd say that even extends beyond those things that we can easily plug into one of the 39 categories of labor. Yeah, electricity might, electronic device could be one of those 39 categories. Like an incandescent light bulb, you're heating up a filament till it glows, that's probably a biblical prohibition. Uh, an electronic lawnmower, that's a biblical prohibition, but just a um, an LCD light bulb or a telephone or not necessarily one of the 39 categories of labor, which means you can be lenient in, if like, you know, in matters of a like great need, like, uh, you know, for medical treatment and things like that. But um uh, it's, I, I really embrace it and I encourage you all to embrace it because I think it really uh, is really, really crucial and key for making the day special and different. Questions or comments? That was the editorial, my editorial, uh, my TED talk. Okay. Um, okay. So the other people, thing I'm just, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do people normally spend their um, Shabbat with family or I think maybe give us some ideas on yeah. Instead of the exclusions, how do people yeah. really enjoy? Sure, thank you for for, for asking that. And I, we, you know, I think maybe two or three weeks ago we mentioned a little bit, but I, I think that that's really really important because it's not just a day of nothing. It's a day, you know, once you've cleared off these twenty five hours without work and 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 worrying about money and 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 the types of entertainment and busyness that we, you know, get involved in during the week, it, it creates this time that's available for uh, really really enjoyable pursuits and and and. Uh, so you just jump to like pre-COVID times, you know, like again, now, now things are a little harder, a little more isolated. It's, it's, it's a little bit harder. Um, and if you like to read, it's wonderful. But uh, um, you didn't, for Friday night, you know, a di dinner with family or friends and nobody's in a rush to go anywhere. Nobody's going someplace else, uh, has no, you know, just, you just enjoy yourself. And then, uh, and then get to, you know, when you're done, read, you know, when dinner's over, sit and read. Um, People sing songs at the Shabbos table, um, um, get a nice night's sleep, wake up Shabbat morning, go to the synagogue, see your entire community. Uh, you're there, you start service at nine, they last till 11, 11.30. There's a little kiddish, she has a snack, you talk to your friends, um, you get invited to somebody's home for lunch, you go down for lunch, um, you're there for a while, nobody's rushing, no one's going shopping, nobody has piano lessons or going to the dentist later, right? You just, spend as much time as you want and then afterwards you take a walk in the park and you'll see someone else from the community because everywhere in the community all of us we all mostly live within a mile of this building and 
all of us are, or most of us are South observant. So none of us are going to grandma's house or going shopping or going to the dentist. So we're just around. And so you can just walk over to a friend's house, knock on the door, they'll be home. Where else, where else are they gonna be? And they'll invite you in and they'll serve you uh, some tea and uh, you know, take a stroll when the weather's nice. And in the, park, and in the playground, you'll just, you'll run into dozens of children from the community because everyone is on the same schedule. There's a real, there's a lot of research um, into the way that like time is not undifferentiated, like time, um, like for example, people who are unemployed also get kind of mopey on Monday morning because all their friends go off to work and they're kind of lonely, right? So uh, even if they don't have jobs, they still get kind of mopey on Monday morning like the rest of us because the friends go off to work and the weekend's over, right? So there, there are, there's a value in everyone being on the same schedule. So everyone having that special time, everyone being available to one another all on the same day. Um, supposed to eat nice food. So you, so this week, ah, this week I researched a new recipe for roast cauliflower. I'm really excited to try it. This week I, I got a new bottle of wine, new bottle of kosher wine from, uh, from Australia. It's a little expensive, but I'm really excited to try it. You know, I hope it goes well with my, with my, with my chocolate, you know, mousse dessert. Okay. Like just, it's, it's an enjoyable, pleasant day. And because nobody's rushing off anywhere else and nobody has other plans, it's an enjoyable day, pleasurable day that you're available to spend, um, with like spiritual pursuits, like a prayer um, and Torah study, and also like social pursuits because your entire community is on the same schedule. Uh, I met a young woman once who um, visited Lakeview uh, for Shabbat. She visited friends. And this is before I lived here, so I can't take zero credit for this. She visited Lakeview uh, for Shabbat, and it was the first time she had spent Shabbat in a community with other young Sabbath observant Jews her age. She was whatever, 25 or something. And they were like, well, these are the 25 year olds who are all observing Shabbat. And I was like, wow, this is like so much more fun than anything I'd ever experienced. But she, you know, she said to me, she, we, we knew each other from elsewhere. She like spoke to me after she had visited. It was amazing because like I, I went to the synagogue in the morning and then we met up with a whole bunch of friends at Kiddush. And then we all went for lunch. And then afterwards we like went around the block and like knocked on another friend's door. And of course they were there and they invited us in. They went to the park together. We played Frisbee and we, you know, just the fact that they were like all these other people all in her stage of life, um, all just doing the same kinds of things and available for one another was really, really special. Um, and that's true for the 25 year olds. It's true for the 35 year olds. Uh, parents of young children have other, you know, when we, we would come to, we have five kids and we would come here and we would always go home in the Shabbos morning. We would come home for lunch with some different constellation of children. Because this one went off to that friend and that one invited this friend over. And then we all meet up in the park afterwards and swap our kids back. Um, and this is like entirely, this is very routine. This is what I'm describing is like any observant Orthodox community in the world has this dynamic. Because um, everyone's available for one another in this way. Really, really special. Um, yeah, and if you're a little bit more introverted, you'd love to read. It's great, right? Because you... Like what else are you gonna do? It's great. So I, I now, since since COVID times, so we're not hosting, so our meals are kind of small. And I, um, like like Friday night, my uh, you know my family tends to go to sleep early. You know my wife is exhausted. Um, she does most of the cooking, so she's like really exhausted after dinner. So she goes to bed pretty early. And I encourage my kids to go to bed. And then it's like the house is quiet, and I sit down with like some uh, bottle of seltzer and some wine and, uh, and like a stack of books. And it's like, it's my favorite time of the week. And maybe 20 minutes later, I'm too tired and I fall asleep also. But it's one of my favorite, uh, for just that, that feeling I love to read, but who has to, and I, it's so hard for me to prioritize, you know, the, the time during the week to do the things that I love, like reading and um, but Shabbat, I, I'm still able to find a little time to, to read. Sometimes I, I try to take a nap on Friday so I don't fall asleep so early on Friday night so I can stay up to read a little bit uh, on, on Friday night. Um, so, so it's really, really a, a delightful, delightful, very pleasant day. And, and by carving out this, this time, but through all of those restrictions of prohibited labor, especially like the no electricity one, right? Which may be again, harder to pin in a biblical prohibition, but is so, so crucial to making the day different and special. Um, it, it really is a wonderful, wonderful experience. That's, that's why I experience it. Um, questions, comments? Talking about drinking wine and salt. Yeah. Syrup. You open the wine bottle or uh, opening up the can of soda? Yeah, so opening the wine bottle is fine. There's no issue with opening wine on Shabbat. Opening the seltzer, some are strict because you're, maybe you're like making a, a tool, right? Because when you, 
break the, you know, like the plastic such about, you know, you break the ring. First of all, I, I actually have a soda stream, so actually it's not relevant. Okay, I'm not drinking. But like the, the old plastic soda bottles with a little ring, you know, it's like a top and there's a ring. So when you break the top off the ring, you've maybe, some would say you've created a tool because what do you have now? Now you have a, 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 a reusable, nifty, seltzer bottle closer and opener, right? Because you can screw it on and screw it off. It's really very durable and useful and you can do all sorts of cool things with it. Um, and before you like broke it and broke disconnected from the ring, uh, it was useless as that. So you've like maybe made a tool. So some people are stretching, they open their seltzer bottles before Shabbat. But it's really and say that's actually not how it's formed. It's actually formed as a bottle top, bottle cover before it gets smushed on top of the machine in the factory. And so actually, even though it's like, so breaking it off, you're just sort of, I don't know, it makes it a little more usable, but it, it was actually existed as a top before even in the factory. Maybe the like metal tops, like the Perrier fancy seltzer tops are different because maybe those are like formed over the bottle in the factory perhaps. And so maybe those were not actual K, were not tools before they put on the bottle. So some are a little more, some, some are strict all bottles, some are strict just with the metal bottles um, and some are, some are lenient. So if you, if you know, you, what you could do though, if you, if you're, if you didn't separate and you want to be strict, you could just take off the top and throw it out. Because then you're saying, and just finish the seltzer, right? Because then you're saying, I'm not interested in creating a bottle top. I just want to get to the seltzer and then I just open it and throw it out. And then it's not a problem. Uh, similarly, opening up a tuna fish can or a can of anything, right? Once you take the lid off, now I have a, oh, look, I just made myself a neat little uh, canister and I can empty it and I can refill it. And, no, but like, so some are strict and not to open cans and shabbat, but if you, those who really need opening cans on Shabbat, they say, no, I'm not, I'm not creating anything that I care about that I want to keep. Open the can, dump out the contents, contents, and throw out the can to indicate that you're not, by removing the top, I haven't created a, a tool that I care about. I want to continue. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so in that regard, if I was to have like a bottle, let's say like coffee or whatever, that I opened up, right, and like, or, or, and I or I finished it or whatever, and I, and I want to just keep this bottle for later for storage. I'm not creating anything. Like, it's still a bottle, and its purpose that I want to use it for is still that. Is that problem? Could that potentially somebody could be, like, problematic to it? I said, or... Thank you so much. Sorry, say it again. Meaning, meaning, meaning you opened a bottle of whatever, and you intend on reusing it only as a bottle, like to refill it again or to re, to re you know, marinara bottle or something like that, let's say. For some reason, you opened up on Shabbat and finished it. And now you want to put something else inside of it later on. So you save right. the glass. Not anything. I, think if, I think if you right. open, if it's like a glass jar. Right, you know, exactly. It right. should okay, be like sorry. a soda bottle, like a plastic soda bottle where you break the rings on Shabbat. And now I've manufactured a lid for my soda top which is okay. reusable to use again. So that would be where some people are sensitive. You could also swap, you could just keep some lids, keep some bottle tops in a drawer and then use those, you know, that would be also an easy way out of it if you don't want to open your soda, open your soda before Shabbat. Uh, okay. I don't know, I, I know I know Hannah, you like you spend a lot of time in Chabad. Do they open their soda bottles before Shabbat? Do you, did you notice that ever? Uh, you didn't notice, okay. If you go, okay, if you, whatever. Back when, when we go, when we get hosted again, you can pay attention, see who, see if your uh, friendly Chabad rabbis open their soda bottles before Shabbat or not. I, some people you see, it's definitely something you see that people do. Okay. All right. Questions, comments? All right, let's pause now. Um, I don't know if we have a next meeting on the calendar because next Monday I was, a meeting and the meeting after that is also a meeting 15th the 15th of february monday the 15th is that work it's president's day but you could probably meet in the evening let's let's meet again 8 30 um i feel like we should meet while we can because we got some holidays coming up in the spring it's going to be harder to meet so we should meet while we can okay awesome all right. Thank you, everyone. If you have, if you think of other questions or comments, email me or text or whatever. Okay. Really love to hear from you. All right. Take care, everyone.